Hey folks, what's going on? I was sitting here editing video and uh, it was crazy weather in New England. We are looking at the window outside here for a second and literally 30 minutes ago, this is what we had. This was literally 30 minutes ago. We had like snow and hail and all kinds of craziness going on out in the Boston Common. It's just calmed down all of a sudden. So that's New England for you. This is the kind of stuff we have to deal with on a daily basis. I was editing some video on a case and I figured I'll just share with you a part of this whole thing because it's kind of interesting. It is talking about emergency visits in endodontics and uh, how can we quickly do a molar emergency visit on a patient that has irreversible pitis and you're trying to get this patient out of pain. Usually when this kind of things happen, it's not like you have plenty of time. It's not like uh, somebody is already scheduled to come in. You have to fit these people in between patients and you don't have a ton of time. So how can you make sure that you address patients' pains adequately and yet be able to be predictable in your approach and safe in your instrumentation. The decision of going from a pulpotomy to a pulpectomy is obviously dependent on uh, the presence of apical periodontitis and the symptoms that the patient has, as well as the, uh, your, the manifestation clinically. When you go in to do a pulpotomy, the question is, can you remove the coronal pulp and is there still a lot of bleeding coming? Uh, from the uh, stubs, the pulp stubs in the canals, and if that is the case, then you should treat those cases. As I always say, if you are going to put a file in any canal, you're committed to treat that canal. The last thing you want to do is to just stab the, the pulp with a small file and then leave it alone. That patient's going to have a lot more pain. So if you're going to get started to get into a canal, then you're committed to kind of clean it out to the end of the route or at least as close to the end of the route as possible. At the same time, you don't want to rush it so that you create ledges and ca cause all kinds of problems. Whether you're going to treat that case yourself or you're going to be referring it after the emergency visit for your endodontist to do it, the first person who's going to get down that canal has the best chance. So in this particular case, I wanted to just share with you, this is a uh, maxillary molar of a maxillary first molar where the patient had uh, pain and signs of irreversible pulpitis. And as you can see, it's just a conventional type of a regular case that you run into, but it has irreversible pulpitis. And so we go in there, I always use a saber cut burr as my outline form to get inside the tooth. And as you can see, uh, we're just removing the pulp. You can create a little bit of a pulp horn kind of a thing. So if you need to give an interpulp, you could do that. I, after, the, after that, I use my long diamond to create a nice uh, flowing shape because that's very important to make sure that your axis is completely flowing. I use a 6856 Dora cut from our Rebel Dendo Axis Kit. You could use whatever equivalent you have. Then I use my E15D ultrasonic tip to go ahead and remove any of the potential loose calcification in the canal as well as any of the dental triangles that might be preventing you from getting the straight line access. Then here's the two files I use, the 1706 endosequence scout and the 1704 endosequence scout. Now in this particular case, as you saw, we had to go in there and do the pulpectomy in the canals because of the fact that there was excessive bleeding after doing the pulpotomy. So you can see that this case is pretty inflamed so I go in there and I use my uh, irrigation using Triton here. And then a combination of originally doing around the 1706 up on top. This is a form of hybridization taper, which I have done a video on using the endosequence and the ESX technique for. This one is the endosequence scouts using combining the 1706 and the 1704 in this particular way to make sure that we do the 1706 to, to do that coronal shaping and then the 1704 moves down a little bit deeper and then using the irrigation uh, with the Triton and then using the E14, the ultrasonic to remove debris and come back and uh, just kind of refill the uh, canals with the Triton. Now, this is a combination of 1706-1704, uh, kind of a going back and forth, back and forth, doing one or two rhythm motions in each file. That allows the files to go down very effectively. That's great for the buccal canals. Now, the paddle canals are oftentimes much larger. In this particular case, we're gonna use a 30 uh, ESR CM, but you could use a 30 in a sequence or whatever size 30 or four file that you have, a little bit of a larger, uh, file for the paddle canal and then once you do that you can quickly clean and remove the debris and dry it and I'm using here a new temporary material this is the BC temp it's the biceramic uh, material that's used as a temporary and it has its own advantages I'll probably do another video on this uh, in the future but 
What I'm doing now is I only inject the BC temp coronally, and then the same way with the BC sealer, I'm using my endosequence scout file, but in a reverse direction, in the uh, counterclockwise direction, to push the, the BC temp down to the apex. Follow that up by cleaning it, uh, the chamber up and placing a layer of Teflon tape, and quickly come back and put a cavet on top of it. And that's it. So this is a very quick way of getting rid of the um, the patient's chief complaint. This should not take really more than a few minutes for this patient. The key here is to determine and administer adequate anesthesia so you don't have to have stops and make sure the patient's completely comfortable. In this particular case, I would always go with a PSA and a buccal infiltration to make sure that the patient is numb, cold test before you get started. And you can just implement this protocol that I just showed you very quickly to get down canals. Now, you would say, well, what about the MB2 and so on? On an emergency basis, you really don't have enough time to go in and search for the MB2. Now, if this was a scheduled patient and you had adequate time, then you probably do a proper uh, exploration and searching for the canals. But my experience is most of these cases are patients that have kind of called in uh, all of a sudden uh, and out of the blue and you have to kind of see them. So in these types of cases, you have to, uh, speed is of essence. Now. You would wanna do this if you feel comfortable managing this patient's anatomy. If you look at the x-ray and the patient has a severe curvature, and if you were not planning on doing a root canal, by all means, make sure you refer the patient to your endodontist and hopefully you have a good relationship with your endodontist so they can see the patient same day immediately and get rid of the pain. The first person who gets into the canal is the one that has the best chance of maneuvering and getting around curves. So you don't wanna get in there and be cavalier and just put files in there and instrument haphazardly if you are planning on referring the patient. In those cases, at least just doing a pulpotomy if necessary, and then placing a layer of the BC temp or regular calcium hydroxide would be what you would need to do. Um, so this is basically, is regarding the BC temp, it's a new uh, calcium hydroxide based material. It's using the biceramic technology uh, that uh, allows you, because as you know, the biceramics have an intermediate calcium hydroxide uh, step. So here we're using the biceramic uh, rate uh, precipitation uh, stage as a means of delivering the calcium hydroxide. You may say, well, what's the difference between using the BC-10 versus regular calcium hydroxide? The main difference here is that you're gonna get a uh, slightly lower but more steady uh, pH level for the calcium hydroxide. So you may get a little bit less cytotoxicity, but more importantly, you'll have a steady uh, release of the calcium hydroxide rather than having your calcium hydroxide get uh, inactivated very quickly as it normally does when you place it inside the tooth by mixing it with just water. Um, so we'll probably do another video on that a little bit later, but I wanted to share with you this concept of emergency treatment for patients that come into your office for emergency care that are in a lot of pain and you want to treat them in as little time. This is a protocol that I currently use and I find that to be very efficient in terms of addressing the patient's chief complaint. Getting down the canals using the combination of endosync and endosync AI is very quick so you can achieve length, know where you are, not go past the apex because you can count on the combination of this handpiece and apex locator combination and with the endosequence scout files because they're heat treated and have a nice um, kind of a hero design and cross section. They are very smooth in terms of cutting and the 1706-1704 combo is a great way of getting down. It's my modern way of hybridization of tapers. Perhaps I should probably do a little bit more, another video where I get into more detail as to why does this concept make sense and so on. If you're interested in me doing that, make sure you comment below the video and let me know what you do for emergency care. I don't use any of these former cresol and any of those uh, materials that have now really been considered carcinogenic. I use the purest type of material possible, so calcium hydroxide, and in this case, BC temp, which is a new way of delivering calcium hydroxide, just as a little bit more steady uh, level of material. Okay, I think that's it for today. I hope this was helpful to you. And comment below what you think, what you do yourself, and uh, until next video, let's save some teeth.